So it's my honor, privilege. It's a real pleasure to have you back. Because, I mean, Eva has been a supporter of Musicor World for many, many years. And we even catch up in other parts of the world. And I keep inviting, and at some stage she say, how can I say no? <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for coming back. <laughs> well, next. Um, thank you so much, Nikos. And I want to thank you for inviting me here again. And uh, I also want to particularly thank you for hanging out at the airport while we're nice lady from New Zealand Customs went through all my luggage in quite a bit of detail. Um, so before, so I want to talk about AI for scientific workflows, but before I do that, I want to, uh, for us to think at the higher level. So workflows are part of the entire um, scientific life cycle, but I want to look at the whole life cycle from the beginning where we ask ourselves a scientific question, we research what kind of knowledge is already out there. Uh, we form a hypothesis. So, for example, why is the weather so nice today in Christchurch? Then we gather resources uh, to try to confirm or disprove the hypothesis. Then we perform various experiments. We analyze the data. We interpret the results. And then we publish our findings if they are successful. And maybe we ask ourselves a, a different research question. And so we see that the, the cycle, the scientific cycle, is changing today. So AI is changing it. So already there was, in 2017, there was a paper uh, looking at how the cycle is being modified uh, with the use of AI. So you have uh, semantic scholar, you had cytomatic that would help you find citations. Um, there's also the first kind of um, look at uh, cloud labs, so in particular Emerald Cloud Lab, which allows you to basically ship your experiments off to the cloud where things are done on your behalf. And a lot of uh, material science chemistry is being done, um, it can be done in that way today. And obviously, ChatGPT um, has come in since then and has really changing, is really changing how we do science and how that life cycle is changing. So while I talk, I want to ask you, you know, to ask yourself, ask you to ask yourself some questions and really how this scientific life cycle will look like 10 to, to 20 years from now. And the issues that the issue, I think Karen you brought up in, uh, in the panel earlier is how will we teach science? You know, how do we, um, how we sign new scientists will be taught to be able to, to do this type of life cycle that we do today or the change you want. How we do, do we share knowledge um, can be fo going forward? And how the work of scientists will change uh, with time? So this is an example of a question being asked by the Southern California Earthquake Center. So they may ask what kind of shaking you can expect in Southern California in the next 50 years. So for, to answer the question, they may explore historical earthquakes. They might look at various models that can tell them where the, the faults are. Um, then they want to, may want to decide which areas they want to focus on. So for example, if you see LA, it has a lot of faults and it's um, very, um, very highly densely populated where the blank areas has basically agricultural land is maybe not as important. And then you want to generate recipes or workflows to answer this question that you pose and uh, find the available compute resources to execute the computations. So um, the recipes that, sci that scientists at the uh, University of Southern California are developing is looking at, ta uh, at taking the information coming uh, from the Uniform uh, California Earthquake Rupture Forecast, various models of uh, kin uh, kinematic uh, rupture generators. Then they do wave propagation and other types of analysis to basically answer the question what, what type of shaking you can expect in a particular area. So they generate shake, sm shake maps that you see on the right. Each point of the map is actually a, a, this individual workflow being executed. The workflow has both MPI codes that do the large-scale simulation, and then they have a lot of post-processing that generate the, the seismic hazard curves. So if you look at the computational requirements for such models, uh, as I mentioned, we have first uh, the high-performance computing uh, MPI codes, there are just a few of them, uh, and then followed by about 77,000 of high-throughput computing jobs that do the post-processing. Uh, these, uh, th and this is the top of the line is basically for one workflow, and then you have the computations that are represented for the entire math at the bottom. 
So obviously you need automation to be able to execute almost 26 uh, million tasks and to move the data across the various computations. You also might think that you want to execute the part of the work for the MPI work from the HPC system and then use a high throughput computing system like HD Condo to run the post processing. However, because there's a lot of data that's being generated on the HPC machine, you actually want to collocate this computing, the high throughput jobs on the HPC system. And so through the technologies that we developed uh, within my group, we're able to run these workflows on the leadership class uh, machines. Uh, so the, the workflow management system that we're using for that was first, uh, we first uh, thought of it in, in 2001. Basically, we're looking, uh, working with a number of scientific domains looking at what commonalities uh, these scientists have between them. And so well, we things that we came, came up with was that they wanted to describe these complex workloads that I showed you in a simple way. Uh, they wanted to access distributed uh, heterogeneous resources, both data and compute resources. So basically scientists want to use whatever is available to them. And oftentimes the communities distribute the data across the wide area networks. Um, also, scientists, even if they have their favorite resource, these resources do change over time, so you need to be able to adapt to that. And obviously, they want ease of use, uh, ability to monitor and debug the workflows. So our focus in Pegasus was really uh, on separating the workflow description, the scientific workflow, from the physical execution of the workflow that is being sent to the, uh, to the machines. So we focus on workflow planning and scheduling, uh, taking into account issues such as scalability and performance. Uh, we also focus on the execution of individual tasks, so we monitor them, we recover from errors, we help users debug the workflows when something goes wrong. And obviously, if you're running millions of tasks, it's very hard to debug, so we try to, to do as much as we can there. Um, and also, we deal with uh, workflow optimization and restructuring uh, for performance and fault tolerance. So um, this is, for example, one of the products uh, that uh, is generated uh, in addition to the seismic hazard maps. You also can generate um, various uh, other type of products using the, the same type of techniques. So this is a simulation uh, of an earthquake on uh, the Southern St. Andreas Fault. And one thing that uh, scientists were surprised about is you see the, the earthquake kind of propagates uh, through Los Angeles and some areas are becoming quiet, the shaking is coming down. However, in LA, there's still shaking going on, despite the fact that the most of the earthquake has passed. And this is because um, Los Angeles is in a sedimentary basin, so when the earthquake waves come in, they just start bouncing back and forth, and the magnitude uh, amplifies. So using uh, automation and um, techniques uh, such as work for management systems, scientists can explore these type of questions and see uh, in the physical world how things would look like. Um, so I've given a lot of talks about Pegasus and including at Multicore um, a, a year ago. So today I just want to focus on, on some other aspects um, and I can talk about uh, Pegasus in more detail uh, at, uh, at the break. However, one thing that we, we've done in Pegasus is we allow users to create workflows uh, using APIs that they're familiar with. So um, in 2001, we, you know, Python was not around, so we did Java APIs. Uh, then bioinformaticians really started liking R for their analysis, so we have APIs in R to uh, generate the workflows. And then obviously Python and Jupyter notebooks have come in. But the, our philosophy is basically take whatever the users have and then use our technologies to map these high-level descriptions. They can also come from uh, portal interfaces. So we take these and we map them on the cyber infrastructure that's available to the users. And uh, so we sub uh, support various HPC systems, clouds, and so forth. So about a year ago uh, at Multicore, Pete was giving a talk. So we're, we're talking about his Sage system and how he has sensors deployed in the environment, and he wants to be able to run things uh, from, from the sensors, so gather data from the sensors and send it to, to the HPC system for further analysis. And he was also wants to then kind of go back and poke the sensors and do additional analysis at the edge. So um, with, with that challenge, I've, I have asked my group to try to see how we can help uh, in this type of problem with Pegasus. So this is the case where basically uh, we don't do anything to Sage, so Sage 
collects the data at the sensors, they store it in, in the Beehive database, and we just retrieve the data from there uh, using uh, Pegasus. And uh, at this point, we also, retrieving data is only part of a problem. We also want to be able to provision the resources that you're going to execute the workflows on. So we did a demonstration with Fabric and Chameleon, which are configurable test beds in the US. So now we can pull the data, we develop simple workflow that pulls the data, uh, temperature readings from the various sensors, and then it calculates the maximum and so forth. So basically, we, I think we, I can add another box to the top of my graph that I showed you a minute ago. Uh, the other thing that we did, um, this is, a, again, a proof of concept, but basically we're able to, we have the plumbing now to be able to ship workflows to the edge. So you can describe your workflow, you put it in the edge code repository and, and use the uh, Sage um, tools to push it to the sensor, and then you can run workflows on the data that's being collected at the edge. And so, Pete, next year we want to show something that shows the actual application doing that. So, with these capabilities, this is really going down to the bottom, but basically if you look at the workflow life cycle, uh, sorry, the, um, the science cycle, we live in this, the workflow management system lives in this uh, bottom area. And so the question is, in general, why is this cycle changing, right? So why now? And it's not only the fact that we have AI, but also we see that users, um, other technologies have come on board, right? So user, users' experiences and expectations are changing. So oftentimes users are not exposed to complex programming. Um, if you give them a command line interface, then most of the users don't know what to do with it. Um, and uh, also, we, I think we talked about it on the first day, but users have uneven access to the, um, to the cyber infrastructure, so you don't want to go to a McDonald's to do your computing. Um, so with, um, with these different experiences, the, the users have also different expectations. So we all use iPads and, uh, and phones, and so, or tablets and phones, and then, so we're used to these interfaces, which are graphical, they also have common behavior, so you're swiping left and on every app it has, you know, a similar type of behavior. Um, and we expect them to be robust. If the app doesn't work, we just delete it from, from our phone. And we want a quick response time uh, for our information. However, there is a big distance between what users uh, experience with and, and their expectations and the cyber infrastructure that's provided to them uh, to do science. So the cyber infrastructure itself is very complex, it's heterogeneous, it's fragmented. Even simple tasks like submitting a job uh, to a system are complex and you have also multi-factor authentication that comes involved, so it, it takes a lot of effort. And uh, in addition, there also is limited support for longer running services. That's kind of my pet peeve from the workflow management system perspective. So the other thing that's changing is the means and the methods um, that uh, the users have, scientists have today. So we have many more data sources. So uh, you have sensors that can be deployed uh, across uh, streams. You have uh, so many of these sensors that you can uh, gather information from. You also have sophisticated in instruments, so for example, cryo-EM machines on, on campuses. You have data that's stored in large-scale archives, again, tons of data that's being collected. You also have access to faster networks and also ac access to, to more computing. So your means are changing, but your methods are changing as well. So we have not only more AI-based methods that are put inside the analysis. Uh, everybody is now talking about large language models and using it to, um, to generate code. And, but we also have more black boxes and basically more codes that people are reusing, even large-scale simulations. Um, you might not be able to, to differentiate under which conditions with which parameters these uh, simulations are actually the most accurate. And so I think there will be, and I think Karen was mentioning it yesterday, yesterday, there is a growing emphasis on verification, validation, and UQ. So now you can get your results faster, but then I think you're spending much more time in the validation verification to make sure that what you're getting is actually right. So because you're spending more time there, I think also there will be more um, need for automation in that area. So in, not only for the computing, but also to automate the methods for uh, verification, validation, and uncertainty quantification. So for example, doing meta-analysis meta with various parameters, various data, 
um, trying to replicate your work under different conditions and also to replicate and reproduce other people's findings. So with that, so basically, um, you know, at a high level, we want to automate things more, but we still deal with issues uh, during work for execution of various anomalies and errors happening during that uh, execution time. So one thing uh, that we're, we're doing, first of all, in addition to, to the execution of work, was we also want to look at how can, from the beginning, how can we do better in terms of um, generating these workflows. Um, so this is uh, just ChatGPT um, uh, plain GPT-4, but we asked to create a, a Pegasus workflow uh, with uh, three steps. Um, that uh, The first step it takes a da data input file, divides it into 10 pieces, and then it uh, takes the, um, these pieces and collects the results. And so, uh, because Pegasus has been around a long time and our code is in GitHub, uh, the, uh, actually ChatGPT was able to, um, to generate the code using the Pegasus API. First of all, it, it told us that we need to install it. Um, and then it talked about the various steps that it needs to do. Um, it generated the code um, to, to have a skeleton of the workflow. Then it said, obviously, you need to also fill in the, the details of the various steps. It just uh, created the structure. Um, then obviously you see there is like the range from, from uh, uh, you know, that goes into 10 with a hard-coded number, so uh, you can tell it, you know, that's, that's not right. And then if you look at, uh, you compare the version, the ChatGPT version, with a version uh, that uh, the uh, lead architect of Pegasus did, they are very different, right? So, so the splitting here is done in parallel, taking one input file, and here basically the splitting is done sequentially. Um, so obviously, this might be better in some, some circumstances. Um, however, uh, at least my mental model, when I asked ChatGPT to do something, it was uh, the one on the bottom. And this is just a very simple example, but it showcases the fact that it's very hard to figure out that you, the results that you're getting are actually the results that you want. Even in, in, so I think more um, attention to actually verification of these type of um, uh, chat GPT generated results is very important. Uh, so the other thing that we can do better uh, using ML techniques is to um, make our system smarter and more, more autonomous. So we've been working uh, with collaborators from um, uh, DOE Labs and Renzi on the program, problem of how to do anomaly detection, um, error classification, and obviously there are various challenges of getting enough data uh, to, do the <coughs> uh, to use the machine learning models um, and quality data and also selecting the appropriate models for particular problems. So in, in our work, we basically looked at different types of techniques that we can use for that. So classical uh, image class uh, uh, techniques like image uh, uh, classification, conversion neural networks, uh, graph neural networks, and uh, large language models. In order to be able to feed these, we, we run experiments on the chameleon cloud, and we inject anomalies uh, during the work for execution so that we can then see if the system actually uh, detects these various anomalies. We, in order to be able to feed uh, the raw data into the uh, ML models, we generate various types of formats, so tables, images, and graphs, um, so that, and text, so they're appropriate for a particular model. So um, we ran various types of uh, algorithms, so this was uh, uh, our students uh, generating Gantt charts from the execution of the workflows and seeing if uh, some of them are anomalous or not. On some of the workflows, we got an accuracy of about 90%. However, this type of approach doesn't translate well to, uh, across different types of workflows. Um, another thing that we tried was to use uh, graph neural networks. And in this case, there was uh, um, an improvement of 25% over a conventional method. But uh, the um, interesting part is that the training time was much faster because uh, the models are smaller. And also the other thing that uh, is beneficial for these models for workflows is that we, we can capture easily the structure of the workflow itself uh, for, for the neural networks. Um, and then the other thing that uh, we've been trying is to using large language models to do uh, anomaly detection. So here we basically take the logs uh, that the workflow generates, we change it into sentences, 
We feed it, in, we feed it into like a number of different uh, types of models. And uh, we, um, this, in blue, you have the models that uh, had no uh, additional training. And then um, we, had, we used the, um, the supervised uh, uh, tuning um, to, um, uh, to tune these models uh, to our data. And you can see on the right, it, these are the, different <coughs> the accuracy of different models. And this shows you the, uh, basically uh, the size of the models and parameters and the training time uh, that it takes to, to train these models. And it turns out that even the models that uh, are smaller, so we talked about this uh, as well earlier, uh, actually perform uh, quite well uh, for, for these uh, type of problems. Uh, however, the accuracy, if you can see, it's uh, only 80%, so we can still do better. So, um, bas you know, I would like to pop back, back, pop back again to the high-level questions that, that uh, I asked you before and think about how will the, the scientific life cycle uh, change in 10 to 20 years. So if we see today in the life cycle, we can put AI to read the papers and summarize it for us, and then we can we, we do the, the computations. The, we can use it to, to try to form new hypotheses. You know, for example, if you're exploring different types of materials, it can suggest uh, different types of um, structures that you can consider. Then we run the experiments. Uh, you can also send them to a cloud lab, so you actually don't have to do it yourself. And <clears throat> you you then when you write the papers, you can also use ChatGPT to write your results as well. So the question is, is really publications, are the publications really the way that we're going to be uh, communicating with each other in the future? Is it how we're going to share knowledge? So, uh, you know, I think we, in some way we need to reimagine things because nobody can read all the papers that are out there. That's why you, you use AI. But also, again, we use tools to help us generate these results. And so uh, the question is, how will we be sharing knowledge? Um, I also wonder, you know, how, the, uh, how will we teach uh, the next generations, right? So what, what kind of information uh, we're going to be giving our students? And even today, you see um, different universities exploring kind of personalized tutors using AI, right? So they, they, uh, they're tuning the, the large language models to be able to be specific to a particular domain or particular class, so the students can converse with them uh, in a certain way. So I'm, I am wondering, truly wondering, uh, you know, how our work will look like in, in this uh, 10 to 20 years, and we will still need scientists, and I, I hope we still do. And then there is, I think, a broader um, challenge that I think we need to look at, well, impact and, uh, that we need to consider is the impact on society. And the, uh, you know, the question here is, can we maintain or enhance, you know, enhance our critical thinking skills? So I do worry that as we use more automated tools, that we, don't, we do lose uh, some of these critical thinking skills that we've been trained to use uh, as scientists. So among them are seeing both sides of an issue, um, being able to be open to new evidence that uh, disconforms our ideas, so again, you know, if in some sense, when you have these conversational interfaces, you're basically looking for a particular answer that kind of proves what you want to know. And oftentimes you don't get the different type, you, you get one answer rather than different types of uh, answers for a particular issue. You know, can we reason dispassionately? Uh, we need to demand that claims be backed up by evidence. So again, you know, various interfaces today, you don't expect or you don't get this kind of, uh, you know, backing up, backing up of, uh, backup of evidence uh, when you interact with them. So I think that's an important one. And then, you know, deducing and inferring conclusions from available facts. Can we do it ourselves or will we be using AI just to, to do it for us? And can we still solve problems? And in some sense, I think, you know, just like today, we exercise so we can maintain our, our bodies, right? I, I think there might be some future where we have to do mental exercises to, to maintain our brains so they function in an appropriate way. And without, I don't want to end on the doom and gloom, but uh, I want to use this uh, quote from Kyle Lars Foster from Heidelberg, um, who said, to be creative, and I want to add curious, um, you have to dislike being bored. And I don't think 
a computer will ever feel bored. So I do hope there is a place for us uh, with our curiosity and creativity and that we use the AI really just as tools to enhance our lives. But really, I think we do have to rethink the way that we're doing science and communicating information and sharing it with each other. Thank you.